I'm going to cover quite a lot of ground in the next 40 minutes, but then I hope we can get into some questions because I know that you're all studying a very different range of topics. Let me see if I can work this better than the microphone. Okay. So, we're told that Asia and Europe are two giants. But what does that mean? We can look at the trade figures and it's fairly um, easy to read. These are two big economic trading blocks, two big political actors globally in a period where we look for economies of scale, leverage in global politics and areas of cooperation in many um, subjects that require transnational uh, cooperation. But my particular area of interest is what a region means. And if we say Asia and Europe have close economic ties, or Asia and Europe have close political engagement, or even some people claim uh, strong security linkages, I'm really interested in what we mean by Asia and Europe. And my conclusion, in case you don't make it that far, um, my conclusion is that there's a problem with the nature of the regions that we're talking about. Because it's very difficult these days to define Asia and Europe in the first place if we then want to explain what we mean by their bilateral or region-to-region -region linkages. So in order to do this, oh, these are um, very typical figures that we see. ASEM, I'm going to talk about in a minute, is the Asia-Europe meeting. And this was a coming together of Asian and Europe uh, states from 1996. These figures are really problematic. And one small example is that in 2003, ASEM was 39 states. In 2015, ASEM is 53 states. So we're not even comparing similar regions when we look at very straightforward figures. So my question to you is, how do we even read the figures if we say that Asia and Europe have close economic ties? We need to be much more specific. And I want to talk about um, three areas of region building. And one is the question of legitimacy or legitimation. I'm, I'm going to come back to this one in a minute. How do we see a region as being legitimate? How is it recognized as a region from the rest of the world? One of them is prominence. How prominent is Asia in Europe? And this is one of the big problems. How prominent is Europe in Asia? When we think about comparing it to the role of the United States in the region, for example which is another lecture that maybe we can save for another day, but might come up in some of our questions. If we look at the Asia-Europe meeting, it started out quite straightforward. It was the EU states plus the ASEAN states of Southeast Asia with China, Japan, and South Korea. But if we look at it in 2015, it's very difficult to see two regions interacting when the included inv invitees are uh, Kazakhstan and Mongolia, New Zealand, Australia. Are these Asian, European? So, in other words, the Asia-Europe meeting itself has become far different from a region-to-region -region engagement. And this was a very straightforward way of looking at the regions in the initial period, in the 1990s. Um, However, the EU High Representative, Catherine Ashton, if you haven't heard of her and you're doing European Union studies, again, the profile and the prominence of some of these people is not the same as uh, national politicians in third countries. But she said the EU and Asia need each other. And I think that sounds good. It sounds important. But again, I would like to know what does she mean? What does she mean by Asia? What does she mean by Europe in the context of the Asia-Europe um, meeting, for example? This is a fairly typical picture. 
of trade between the two regions. And the reason I'm showing it to you is because it tells you what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say that the broad brush, the broad picture says, ah, yeah, Asia and Europe, there's something important. The levels of trade are significant. But actually, what it points to are major bilateral concerns, and of course, the key role of China. If you take China out of the Asian pot, what, what is left? I mean, there's a lot left, but it's a very different picture. So again, do we need to think more carefully about EU-China relations? Or can we actually talk about EU-Asia relations? Now, I argue later that there's a reason to do both, but that actually talking simply in high diplomacy uh, terms about EU and Asia can lead us to think that they are failing because they're not as significant as a relationship as, say, the US in the region of Asia. What is happening more commonly within the region is this. You will all know about this um, because South Korea was the big um, lead in this project. But actually, what's interesting for me is that the EU ASEAN free trade agreement, as many of you know, was shelved in 2009 after two years of very difficult negotiations, failed to bridge the differences that there were politically as well as economically between the states of the EU and ASEAN. Again, there are people in this room who know much more about the free trade agreements than I do, but I think we need to ask what this means. A lot of uh, EU Asia commentators, or a number of EU Asian commentators, I should say, are suggesting that these bilateral trade agreements are illustrative of a splintering of region-to-region -region relations. They're not building a region, but actually going back to bilateral interests. Now, Asia and Europe is not just about it's not just about economics. And there are a number of security concerns that are genuinely reflected in the mutual diplomacy between many states of East Asia and the states of the European Union. And these include, in particular, as is the case for many Asian states, the need to secure open and free sea passage for trade and to keep these areas conflict-free and we've seen in recent years a real escalation of the tensions in the South China Sea. That's a very major area of concern to many states around the world, including the European states. The European Union has always been interested in monitoring and taken a, a serious interest and in concern over historical flashpoints, China-Taiwan in the 1990s especially, but still today the North Korean issue concerns over, over North Korea and its in recent, uh, in recent years incursions into the seas around this area, but also under security concerns, wondering about the uh, growing militarization of China, the role of China in the region, particularly over territorial claims in the South China Sea, and that being a, a direct threat to economic interests as well. So the interlinkages between security um, and economics are very important. The thing to say about these, though, is that rarely do we see discussions on the news about EU-Asia talks about North Korea. Really, this is something where EU and Asian states discuss issues that are also raised in other important fora, notably in the case of um, North Korea, the six party talks. So again, we're looking at reflecting debates on security that happen in other fora. The EU Asia is not the place for the security of, of Asia Pacific. We don't discuss it in a way that is not discussed elsewhere. It's a, a monitoring and a reporting element of EU Asian affairs. Asian states do observe what's going on in NATO and how the EU model of common foreign security policy, the new security policy, 
is being played out in Europe as possible models and templates, but also for monitoring what's going on in, in Europe. So there is a mutual level of interest and concern. But I would say that there is not one binding key security element in their relationship. In the United States, we can point to the US. In South Korea, we can point to the US-Japan alliance. And we can appoint, uh, point to the Seventh Fleet in the South China Sea. We can look at lots of uh, very direct elements of security. What I think, and I know that um, you should all be reading the work of Professor Sung Hoon Park on this, is areas of what we might call non-traditional security or soft security are actually areas where the EU is quietly working with Asian partners to address issues of counter-terrorism, anti-piracy, um, even things like development assistance and migration issues, collecting data, sharing information, creating databases, and creating joint approaches to dealing with trans-border problems. These, I think, are areas that we need to look out for, areas where there is some developing interest that is very meaningful in terms of EU's interest in, in the region more broadly. Let's have a look at just the anti-piracy. This is a particular strength of Japan in the region, who's been working with uh, the EU, but, but also in Somalia, and learning lessons around the coast of Somalia. And the greatest contribution to the Somalian anti-piracy campaign has been from the ASEM states, the Asia-Europe alliances. This is perhaps not where we would imagine to find Asia-Europe cooperation. Um, but piracy there affects trade significantly in both regions. There is a direct mutual threat. And working together on combating piracy is proving to be highly effective. Again, piracy is really important or combating piracy is really important for South Korea. Its maritime fleet tr travels through this region and its global shipping industry um, has pressing needs to secure ship free, sh free shipping lanes. Um, the multi-donor anti-piracy trust fund, the two biggest donors are Japan and South Korea. And they're focused on land-based anti-piracy uh, initiatives in Somalia. So again, supported by the European Union um, and working very carefully in something called the Regional Cooperation Agreement on Combating Piracy and Armed Robbery Against Ships in Asia. That's a little bit of a mouthful. Um, but it includes many European states alongside, uh, alongside its Asian partners. So I think we shouldn't, I'm not, I'm not underestimating the role of security cooperation between Europe and East Asia. But what I am saying is that if we constantly look for the big ticket items, for the big headline grabbing security issues, then we might be disappointed. Anti-piracy is hugely important, but tends to be underreported. The other issue where there's a number of developments in terms of cooperation is, is counter-terrorism. And this has been discussed even within the ASEM Forum since 2002. My students in England always think that ASEAN is just for talking and not for action. But I look at the record of ASEAN and I say, talking is really important. And building up mutual trust, building up information, building up the means to cooperate is actually an essential part of, of inter-regional diplomacy. And what we've seen in terms of counter-terrorist initiatives have been that much broader engagement in terms of exchanging information and sharing knowledge. But also since 2011, focusing on aspects of human rights and the rule of law, looking at international conventions and protocols against terrorism. And here there's a normative agenda, particularly from the Europeans, to bring in uh, human rights issues um, into the discussion.
When I first started looking at Asia-Europe relations uh, some years ago, over a decade ago, I didn't take seriously the third pillar. There's a politics and the security, oh, sorry, economics, politics and security, and the socio-cultural pillar. But a number of you are from European states, a number of you will visit and spend time in European states, and the Asia Europe Foundation is one example. There are many other foundations, including those represented here today, of student exchange, interpersonal, people-to-people -people exchange. And if you look at the figures for the Asia Europe Foundation alone, you can see that it's run over 650 conferences, workshops, have 700 partners. And that means we've seen the movement of over um, 17,000 people. This is not just students, but also journalists, a huge business uh, lobby exchanges, politicians exchanges, parliamentarians exchanges. So socio-cultural affairs, in a way, are the foundation of building future ties between these two regions. Whether we understand it as bilateral, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you go from Korea University to my university in Birmingham, or whether you're going as an ambassador for Asia to visit Europe. It, in a way, it fulfills the same role. So those are the areas, the politics, the economics, and uh, the social areas that Asia Europe has been trying, particularly through the Asia Europe meeting, to portray its relations since the 1990s. And incidentally, the 1990s, the European Union looked at the financial crisis in Asia in 1997, and the first response from the European Commission finance minister was to say, don't worry, it won't affect us. There was no understanding or very little understanding of how Asian economies were growing and how they were key to the future of the European project and its own economic well-being as well. That changed, and in a way the Europeans, I would argue, have in some areas been playing catch-up since that time. What we see in evaluations of Asia-Europe relations since the 1990s are many different voices. I wrote a very positive book in, in 2002. I'm not sure my book would be quite so positive in 2014, but one of the things that we see is regionalism is not just about institutions. You can build an institution, but regionalism is also a normative project of projecting an ideology or a fundamental set of principles and rights. And when you look at the European project, it's very much about Western uh, liberalism, it's about human rights, it's about freedoms and responsibilities. And those have been threaded all the way through the trade agreements, security agreements that have been made with Asia and, of course, other parts of the world since the European project started in the 1950s. Um, the problem is that in the case of Asia-Europe relations, you can see Jokola and Gans's evaluation of 2012 says, really, that just means that we get a forum for formal statements and a very shallow exchange of ideas. If we all have to adhere to human rights, China is not that interested, Myanmar is not that interested in signing up to the same levels of agreement. So we end up with the lowest common denominator. So the Asia-Europe relationship has been, in a way, uh, struggling to maintain prominence because it can't deal with the big ticket issues. In terms of security, the perception in East Asia, you might disagree with me and you might argue that this is not the case, but my understanding of the perception in East Asia is that the EU is an economic bloc, primarily. Most people do not see the European Union as an alternative form of security structure 
that could be used or used to assist uh, East Asia. So again, the security side of uh, Asia-Europe relations is underplayed. And then, again, Asia and Europe as a, as a body is now 53 member states. So where do we go from here? And where we go, according to Peltman and who, does ASEM work as a format for bringing together Asia and Europe? Well, if you want results beyond simply dialogue and mutual understanding, you need another type of institution, one that has a normative structure through it and is not just a loose set of institutions. So where we're at after nearly 20 years of Asia-Europe meetings is that in every summit, and if you look, I've spent far too much time looking at summits between Asia and Europe, they all say, first of all, we have to decide what we're for. First of all, we need to find a vision. And 20 years after setting up as a region-to-region -region dialogue, we're still looking for our mutual vision. And I think this is a real problem. And it's a problem about the legitimation of a region. The problem is deeper. Let's look at, let's look at it in two ways. Let's look at the EU as a region and the EU in Asia, and then quickly look at Asia as a region and Asia in Europe. And if we do that, we see very quickly. I also should say, being from the United Kingdom, of course I have a very, a very negative view of the European Union. No, it's not true. I live in a country, I live in a country where there are many negative views of the European Union. Um, but beyond my country, for the first time in my experience, there are a lot of negative views of what Europe is for, what Europe is doing, problems uh, related to the crash after 2008, to the austerity drive, particularly linked to the Eurozone crisis, questions of the validity of uh, Greece's demands um, and whether Greece should be in or outside the Euro, questions of the struggles uh, in Spain, the very high levels of youth unemployment in particular, demonstrations against the austerity and the demonstration here is not a demonstration in, in Greece or in Spain but it's a demonstration in Germany against the um, inauguration of the new European Central Bank headquarters saying um, for many people it's just too painful, too much and it's been going on for too long. So there's a lot of discontent, there's a lot of rise of right-wing politics, anti-immigration politics, anti-European politics that goes way beyond um, my country uh, in a way that I haven't seen uh, before now. Um, as a result of this inward-looking Europe, there's a lot to deal with at home. There's a lot of mess to be cleaned up. The idea of legitimation outside is very difficult to find. So we've seen delivery deficit, the EU not turning up as a coherent group and um, in third countries. So its foreign policy looks lacklustre. We've also had huge amounts of enlargement, much of it contested, levels of um, cohesion and adherence, newcomers perhaps not signing up to delivering the same levels of, say, for example, governance structures that one would have expected. And then a diluted sense of the original aims and institutions. Now, all that having been said, we've seen in 2007 the Lisbon Treaty, which uh, reinvigorated in a way and consolidated where the European Union uh, was at and amalgamated or merged the previous treaties and then devised the role of the high representative of the European Union. So we saw an actual physical foreign policy face. I know that if you showed that to every person in England, possibly 0.5% percent of people would know who she was. 
the European Union foreign policy uh, face is not particularly well known around my country, and I would argue let alone uh, in third countries. So again, looking for that strategic vision is still something that hasn't been achieved. And then there's another reality, and the reality is that we've got other problems. I am more interested in what's going on in the Ukraine as a citizen of Europe than in what's going on in North Korea. It seems like more of a strategic problem for my country. If my country bordered the Ukraine and Russia, which many European countries do, then you can see why an idea of embracing Asia as an inner partnership is lower, significantly lower on the agenda. And it's not just about Russia and the Ukraine and the possibility of a war, which is a real possibility, but until, especially until the dramatic fuel price um, decline recently, people were seriously worried about uh, access to fuel, an energy crisis. That's a crisis that I recognize in Asia, but it's not a crisis with the same origins. Um, and finally, we've all got problems. We've got an election in the UK coming up in the next month, couple of months. So we're looking at kicking out corrupt politicians and getting more money in our pocket and improving our education system and hoping that our hospitals will function when our people are getting older and older and our young people are not having enough babies. That's what we're worried about. And then we're worried about an idea of Europe but only because of the immigrants coming into our country. Now, this is the kind of discussion I don't share, but this is the kind of discussion that you're getting on the ground within the European Union. As I say, the United Kingdom Independence Party is, not, is, is typical of many of the right-wing successes that we're seeing around the region, at least in their profile, if not grabbing uh, political seats. So all that to say... The European Union is in a period of crisis. And at the same time, where is it? Where is it in Asia? These are regional associations. The European Union is in ASEM, but it's one of 53, or it's, it's part of a 53-state conglomeration in ASEM. Most of the major decision-making bodies in the Asia-Pacific region do not include European interests. And if we had to pick two key players here, you'd pick China and the US. I would argue. You can argue against me. But I think if you look at the major concerns of ASEAN right now, you look at the major concerns of the Pacific states, although climate change is a huge security threat for them right now, but if you look um, at APEC, look at the other initiatives that the US, I'll come to that in a minute, has uh, inaugurated, we're really seeing a period of um, questioning what East Asia is about, and I'll, I'll come to that in a moment. But the European Union and key European states, despite and maybe because of colonial heritage within the region, is not present. Until recently, we might also have argued that it's all about China. Trade is increasing dramatically, but you can see how the unevenness of the figures is causing major concern for the European Union. It's a massive export market. Most of my, uh, our domestic politicians have headed to China in the past year because we're taking trade party after trade party to try and do new deals uh, with China. But the EU has a major trade deficit with China and again is very concerned about things like market access barriers that are ongoing. So there's a lot of focus on China when we talk about Asia. And we might argue that really if, if you take China off the table then the whole question of Asia for the European Union sinks dramatically down the list of priorities. There's also no political clout in the region. That's what I've mentioned earlier. 
It's not a key member. The European states are not a key member of political fora that are specifically looking at issues like the six party talks. They're excluded from the East Asia Summit. Now, this is a, quite a major um, project within the region, one of, one of the possible futures of Asia. And what we see instead are bilateral talks with key players. And again, the overshadowing of Europe in many ways by what, the Europe, by what the US is doing in the region. I recently read an article about the new EU pivot towards Asia. I'm not sure I've seen a pivot, but of course that's a direct reference to what the Americans are perceived to have done. So there's a, there tends to be a follow thy leader approach to how America uh, deals with the uh, Asia Pacific region. Um, so that's the EU and the EU in Asia. And what about um, regionalism in Asia? Oh, this is my favorite topic, so we could be here for some time. Um, but what is Asia? What is East Asia? In England, people say, I'm going to Europe. My friends in Japan say, I'm going to Asia. I don't know what Korean people say, whether they say, I'm in Asia, I feel Asian, or I'm visiting Asia on my holidays. Um, but since 1997, in the, in the wake of the financial crisis, we've seen a plethora, many different forms of initiative for growing Asian regionalism. And I don't think this should be underestimated. If you look at the level of engagement of China in the region before the mid to late 1990s, you didn't see it. What has been happening since the 1990s is a very exciting set of developments that sees bodies for mutual dialogue and discussion and forums for actually debating some of the most important contemporary issues in a way that was just not possible before that time. So although it's still a spaghetti, I'm going to argue, it's actually a really important spaghetti. Um, what we see within the region is inter-regional competition, the growth in particular of ASEAN, ASEAN recognizing that it needs to stand up straight against Japan, China, South Korea, <coughs> and in so doing, building its own economic community, which is designed to be completed by the end of this year. So you have lots of different initiatives, and many of them are focused on economics. But many of them are also focused on what to do with China and the US. How to balance different security and different political interests within the region. And here you can see, Japan likes the US inclusion in the East Asia Summit. It has the safety of its ally in a very broad de delineation of what East Asia and Asia Pacific can mean. The Chinese, in contrast, prefer the ASEAN plus three process, a much narrower uh, interpretation of Asian cooperation. And as you know, the Asian infrastructure uh, bank that has been recently inaugurated by China is a very interesting move politically in what it says, um, what it potentially says about China's leadership of an Asian regional um, initiative seen as a rival for the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and also the Asian Development Bank, which has traditionally been in the hands of the Japanese. These are not just economic initiatives. These are bold regional political statements. And I think they're really interesting to follow for those reasons. At the same time, the Obama pivot brings with it the Trans-Pacific Partnership, a kind of resuscitation or a a rebirth of what was failing in the APEC summit, to bring uh, the US back to create a, a regional regulatory and investment treaty that keeps the US central within the region of the, of the Pacific. It, hasn't, it has a long way to go, um, but there's a lot banking on its success from the American poli foreign policy point of view. So in Asia, we see all these different initiatives trying to create different forms of Asian regionalism. And the role of China and the role of the US is central to how that's being played out. Asian politic, 
politicians and leaders are interested in Europe. They're interested in building political and security relations. But some will argue, many argue, the European Union is not viewed as a serious political or security actor in East Asia among the regional countries. I would be really interested to know if any of you have done um, research into this because I think different views of the European Union as a model, different views of it as an economic destination, but then different views of it as a, as a regional, normative, regional enterprise. From what I can see, it's primarily, primarily seen as an economic, uh, economic, distant economic actor that has interaction within the region. I also think, from a European perspective, we do well to remember that Asia is not really about region-to-region -region engagement. There's an intra-regional um, dimension about growing this regional profile, the legitimation of, of a regional body and set of bodies. And there's also this notion that Asia is a set of uh, economic and political security interests that are globally relevant. It's way beyond uh, just dealing with other regions, but dealing with other parts of the world and dealing at the global level in structures of global economic governance and structures of global uh, politics. Um, emerging economic cooperation among East Asian countries is designed to address global issues. It's not designed to address interregionalism. So I've just kind of said interregionalism is pointless, but it isn't. I think the, re the reason that we talk about region-to-region -region cooperation is because uh, the EU needs an international profile. Asia benefits from a growing international profile that brings economies of scale, allows for large-scale enterprises, like the EU ASEAN Free Trade Agreement, if that could be resuscitated. And then the really significant issue of security cooperation over transnational problems of mutual concern, like the anti-piracy agenda. The legitimacy comes from creating a level of actorness. As I've suggested, we might argue there's a lack of unified strategic vision within the European Union, but it gains legitimacy for its own regional projects if other regions imitate it and if other regions engage with it. So we're looking for international legitimation. Similarly, within East Asia, for a long time there have been attempts to... Um, my area is Japanese foreign policy and the Japanese government has a love-hate relationship with the American government. It's a very difficult line to tread. And that's the same for many states within the region. To move away to balance the role of the United States within the region, balance that against the growing role of China within the region, and look for an additional partner in a multiple different activities. It also should be said that since 1997, China's regional engagement has been matched by China's global engagement. China is not looking to be a lone wolf. China is looking constantly for its own international legitimacy through a range of partnerships and a range of different regional and uh, trans-regional initiatives. So what should we do? If I argue that Asia-Europe relations as a statement really means very little because it's too big and because the items that we think are important are not covered, what benefits Asia-Europe relations really bring are growing bilateral trade, particularly between the EU and ASEAN, and then the EU and a range of key bilateral uh, trading partners. And you can see from the figures that the growing bilateral trade is not an insignificant set of figures. But also that the volatile situation within Asia the redefinition of relationships and power, unresolved territorial claims in maritime areas are a direct threat to European trading interests. So again, working on areas of um, peace and reconciliation over territorial claims, but particularly things like anti-piracy um, 
is really important. The European Union could also take a much bigger role in the ASEAN Regional Forum, which again my students argue is just a talking shop because it doesn't deal with the big ticket issues. But I think sometimes it's about dealing properly with the smaller, and they're not smaller, but the less uh, headline grabbing issues underneath it. The other thing I'd like to just throw in is that European Union is a major development aid partner for many regional initiatives. Um, and building development cooperation, reinforcing that normative profile of the European Union as spreading uh, democratization, uh, rule of law, human rights, has been a major goal of the European Union over the last 50 years. And added to that, our key social agenda as well. And bringing those um, human resources to bear, increasing the number of um, exchanges between the two regions at all levels, at all levels, from the top, which are you, students, because you're the future uh, leadership of your regions, to existing politicians, probably at the bottom at the moment, in terms of their rankings, um, and bringing different layers of communities together. But what I find in a lot of the literature is an effort from, on the part of European Union to internationalize Asian educational um, institutions. And then I come here. Korea University has one of the most international, dynamic um, educational exchange programs I have ever seen. So I think sometimes the way that the documents are written, we need to be looking to learn from both sides. And I think in, in terms of social cultural exchange, we could do a lot more. So my final, my final um, point is to say that legitimation comes from having a name in the region. It's important for the European Union to have a presence in Asia. It's important for Asia to have a regional dimension, but its prominence will come from dealing with issues that are meaningful for our two regions and not trying to copy issues that are dealt with elsewhere and that are not, not directly relevant to each and every one of us in this room. The current foreign policy documents in the European Union to be successful, according to Wiseman, need to change a foreign policy focus to East Asia. This is unlikely in the near future, given the crises that we face regionally and that we face globally. But what we can do is build on the small and significant steps of mutual engagement that I've suggested so far. I'm very happy to receive any questions, and would just like to say thank you. Thank you.